Welcome. My name is Gayatri Ramprasad, and thank you so much for joining us. I'm the founder and president of ASHA International, a nonprofit organization dedicated to normalizing conversations about mental health and inspiring hope and healing one story at a time. At ASHA International, we believe our stories are our superpower. Every time we share our story, we can end the stigma and shame surrounding mental health conditions, give hope to those who are struggling, and help build communities of empathy, inclusion, and support to help every one of us thrive. Today, I'm delighted to welcome Dior Vargas for a conversation on the healing power of speaking your truth. Dior is a Latina feminist mental health activist advocating for equitable mental health care for all. She is the creator of the People of Color and Mental Illness Photo Project, a response to the invisibility of Black, Indigenous people of color in the media representation of mental illness. She's also the editor of The Color of My Mind, a photo essay based book based on photo project. She tours the country giving keynotes, hosting workshops, and speaking on panels. Her work and insight have been covered in media outlets such as The New York Times, Forbes, Newsweek, and NBC Latino. Dior is the recipient of numerous awards, including the White House Champion of Change for Disability Advocacy across generations under the Obama administration. You can learn more about Dior and her work at DiorVargas.com. Please feel free to post your questions and comments during our conversation with Dior. We'll be happy to answer them. Hi, Dior. Welcome. Hi, how are you? I am good. I am so excited, delighted that you can join us. Thank you. Thank you. Um, growing up in India, you know, one of the most famous adages, you know, pr principles that we grew up with is Satya Meir Jayate, truth alone triumphs. Mm -hmm. We all know that our truth will set us free, but when it comes to matters of mental health, it is so difficult to share the truth. And that you, here you are, sharing your truth every day in every way that you can to ensure health equity for all of us. So what inspired you to share your truth and how has it helped you manage your own depression? Yeah, uh, I have been an advocate for a long time, focusing on a bunch of different issues like domestic violence, body image issues, as well as reproductive rights. And I decided that I wanted to focus on something that was more connected to my daily life. And so for me, it seemed like everything that was part of these different topics was mental health. Mm -hmm. And so I just decided that I wanted to be open and honest because it was something that I had never uh, shared before. So it really helped me when it came to really understanding my story, because I think a lot of times we just experience it, but we don't really have a good understanding of it. And I think that the more we write about it, the more we talk about it, there's a lot of uh, self-reflection and an opportunity, <clears throat> an opportunity to grow. So I just wanted to be able to support other uh, young by POC uh, with my story to show them that there are other conclusions or other things that happen to people's uh, stories. Uh, in the sense that it, it's not always going to end up negative. Uh, it's something that you are continuing to work on uh, because there's a lot of things that are shown in the media representation and it doesn't come out in the most positive light. So trying to show that there's a different way of living when it comes to living with mental illness. Yeah, and that is so important now more than ever, Dior. And so thank you so much for doing what you do every day. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. You know, adverse childhood experiences, like you mentioned, you know, whether it's immigration or generational trauma or divorce or domestic violence or bullying, all of which you have experienced. And there are so many millions of children and young adults experiencing this. So these adverse childhood experiences can have a very long lasting impact on the health and well-being of a person. So what helped you overcome these experiences and really what gave you hope, what helped you heal? Yeah, I think that a lot of times uh, we're thinking about scarcity and the deficiencies within communities and really we should be thinking about their assets and things that are protective factors rather than risk factors. And so for me, it was having a loving and supportive family. Not always supportive uh, in terms of like 
dealing with uh, the topic of mental health, mental illness, uh, it was something that we didn't talk about. And so that was a support that I was lacking. But I think that my grandmother, um, my maternal grandmother, she really just gave me the support that I needed. So it wasn't that I was completely without support, but she was the main one that really taught me that it was okay to cry, that it wasn't a sign of weakness, but a sign of strength. So I really felt like my vulnerability was something that I didn't have to hide and that I should really be using in my day-to-day life. And I think that's kind of what inspired. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Sorry, I always get emotional when I think about her and when I oh, talk about her. Yeah. So, yeah, I just think that having a supportive family, uh, also I focused a lot on school. With a lot of things that I was going through, the only things that I felt like I had control over were, were my studies. So trying to be in as many clubs as possible in high school, uh, making sure I did all my homework and everything like that. Uh, Also with my grandmother, she really instilled in us the importance of education and that that was something that couldn't be taken away from you. So always working to uh, be on first honors every year. Um, So just wanting to make myself proud too, to show myself that there would be good things and that I could make something uh, of my life, something that was positive. So- Well, and you have made an incredible life for yourself. I couldn't Thank be happier and proud of you. you. You've gone on to get, a, you know, MS and an MPH and, you know, um, just I mean, the amazing accomplishments that you already have had in your young life. And yeah, um, thank you for every single country. And you make a really important point, Dior, which is, you know, we talk about the barriers within cultures to mental health, which are real, like you said, a lack of understanding of mental health as part of the overall health and well-being of a human being, whether it's, you know, my culture, I come from India, or the Latina culture, or other cultures, every culture inherent within each culture, there are these cultural misperceptions and barriers to mental health, which are real and which should be addressed, which also focus at the same time on the incredible resilience factors, like you're saying, you know, the protective factors, you know, because within all of these cultures, despite the barriers, there's also a loving family most of the time, a loving family who are not educated about mental health issues, and therefore it can become a traumatic or a toxic environment. But as long as we can recognize that and educate the family and educate the community about what mental health is, and really, um, celebrate the strength and the resilience within each family and each community, I think we, you know, all of us can thrive. All of us can thrive. There's no need for us to suffer the way we do. So yeah, yeah, you know, and and again, all it takes is one person, one person to have that faith in you, to see the strength in you, especially in those dark times. And I'm so glad your grandma was there. I am so, so glad. Um, are, are there, uh, in addition to having your grandmother's love and support, the emphasis on education within your culture, um, your own hard work and self-determination, were there other aspects to your, uh, you know, in your journey to well-being, you know, that might have been specific to your culture? You know, for example, uh, in the Indian culture, you know, for me, as, as hard as my journey was, learning how to meditate how to mm. practice, you know, pranayama, which is a whole school of deep breathing, you know, practices, uh, or yoga, for example, or, you know, all of these practices that are so ancient that are inherent within our cultures can be, and for me, has been life transforming. So are there culturally responsive pathways to healing that you discovered in your own journey? Yeah, a lot of times uh, my family would pray uh, during tough times or just, you know, any type of situation it was just something that we always thought about prayer and always believing in god and uh knowing that uh he and it may, and i think she you know he or she uh, will be there for us and i have the same struggle <laughs> <laughs> yeah so yeah like my and also my grandparents specifically my grandfather he would always like candles and he'd have certain things by the door so i think that just prayer and spirituality and religion was really important to my family. And so that was something that I was always thinking about and always having the idea that um, God doesn't give you what you can't handle, which, you know, I kind of have uh, mixed feelings about that, but trying to focus on the positive aspect of that. So um, also just wanting to keep my family proud, but that's like across all cultures, so. Yeah, absolutely. You know, uh, COVID and the racial injustice in our country has highlighted 
highlighted in ways that we never imagined the disparities, the health inequities, uh, among all other inequities, right? And so do you have any advice moving forward on how we can bridge the gap? Yeah, it's, it's really difficult because at least I can speak for myself, but I think a lot of people feel like there's just so many structural and systemic things in place that really prevent us from being able to move up and uh, improve our lives. Uh, so I'm, I'm just thinking in terms of like even day-to-day -day things, like mm -hmm. I know that a lot of um, by POC are more likely to get COVID, um, especially when it comes to one's age and everything like that. So just making sure that we're taking care of ourselves, that allies can support the community as much as possible. Resources like food pantries, like just also like maybe even doing food shopping for people uh, if they don't wanna go outside. Um, my Unfortunately, my family, including me, we all got COVID and um, both of my grandparents were hospitalized and it was, uh, April was a horrible month, but oh, I am so proud that, and happy. <laughs> Um, mm -hmm. that my family uh, was able to uh, get through it and we're all uh, still here. So, um, oh, goodness, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's especially since I'm in New York City, which is was the epicenter, but now it seems like it's going on a-, on a well, uh, You have role models now of how we right. address. Right, yes. yeah, I feel like it's on a US tour of, you know, where it wants to be the epicenter. Um, so yeah, just, just being supportive of one's family. I think mental health, is something that's in that's in the struggle right now because we're isolated and we're in quarantine and the life that we knew is not happening. I don't want to say that it's never going to be the same again. I'm trying to be positive about that, but as of right now, um, mental health is something that's really uh, needs to be prioritized and uplifted. So, focusing on our mental health and, and checking in with uh, each other yeah. are, are some of the things we could do. So how are you taking care of your own mental health and helping your own family? Well, I'm always, uh, every week I have my therapy. So that's like my ultimate form of self-care and it's also my favorite day of the week. It's just a way for you to just connect, learn, and um, also hold yourself accountable um, to certain things and, and a lot of self-reflection. Like therapy is not easy, it's very hard, but it's very, very worth it. Um, I'm not ashamed to say I take medication. so having that um, daily slash weekly sort of uh, regimen, if you want to call it, uh, where I'm still thinking about my mental health. There have been times where I got annoyed with taking medication and so I stopped and I quickly learned that that it wasn't the best thing to do. So making sure that I was thinking of my ultimate uh, self-care, my ultimate health. Yeah. So that's what I've been doing. Also just trying to really focus on work, uh, focus on the other things that I have going on. Uh, connecting with my family. I've been staying with my sister for the past couple of weeks, almost two months. Um, and while we have argued um, every so often because we're sisters and we're very close, um, to be able to be with someone uh, and kind of share those those thoughts about the whole situation and commiserate, uh, I think is really important. Also, um, seeing my family when I can. Um, so yeah, just connecting with people, I think is just extremely important. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, according to the 2017 Youth Risk Behavior Surveillance Survey administered by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention for people ages 10 to 24, it was found that one out of every 10 Latinas had attempted suicide in the past year, and two out of 10 had made a suicide plan, and half of all Latina teens said they have felt hopeless. What words of hope? First of all, what are the contributing factors behind these statistics? And then what words of hope and comfort do you have for young Latinos? Yeah, uh, I, I definitely have um, personal experience um, and, and I, I believe you had already described that in the intro, but um, being someone who was a suicide attempt survivor who had tried multiple times from the ages of 11 to 18, like that was a, a form of coping, not the healthiest, but it was just the way I was coping. And I think it's, in my experience, but then also the experiences of other Latinx youth uh, is being between like, it's like a border culture. It's like being between the culture of your family, which is very traditional, very uh, collective and, and everything you just do together. And that's your priority. And then dealing with the fact that you're in an American culture where it's very independent and you kind of 
I hate the, the phrase, but like pull yourself up by your bootstraps and, and um, it's, it's just, there's this like sense of independence and freedom. And so there are a lot of things that are at odds with that. Like the certain expectation of what a young woman should be, how she should act. Uh, so being in between those two cultures and those two identities can be very overwhelming. Um, also one's relationship with their mother. Um, I think across all cultures, um, people's relationships with their mothers, specifically mothers and daughters uh, can be very uh, strained and uh, difficult. Uh, but I think also just with the fact that there's this sort of border culture, um, I think that also can impact how you live your day-to-day -day life. Um, in terms of what I would say to young Latinas, uh, hold on, um, really just try to take care of yourself. It's not always gonna be this way. Um, thinking uh, in terms of like short-term goals, long-term goals, uh, let's say you're in a situation where you don't feel supported by your family, um, just removing yourself, not blaming yourself. It's a lot of work, but honestly, it's it's very worth it. Uh, my mom always reminds me of the fact that if I had succeeded or rather I had completed yeah. my suicide, that I wouldn't be where I am. I wouldn't have accomplished what I have. And um, in hindsight, of course, that's easy to say, but really you you don't know how much you can contribute how much you can accomplish it's not about productivity but it's like your own life like how you can live an amazing life i think that's really important to to remember so please hold on it won't always be this way and um there are people that love you you may feel unloved but i guarantee you there's at least one person that loves you and wants you to be happy and succeed yeah and asking for help is so important knowing mm -hmm. that it's okay to ask for help and when and where to get that help, right? So what in your own journey, what what was the point at which you had enough awareness to know that you needed help and where did you seek help and was it helpful the, the very first time you reached out for help? Yeah, uh, so I just noticed that uh, how I was feeling day to day, I was very irritable, I was very upset, I was very depressed, I didn't wanna do anything, I was isolating myself, just, all these things that I wasn't used to. And so I, I myself realized it, but then I also, um, it was brought to my attention by my mom and my family as well. So I decided to just look online. Um, in high school, there was the internet. <laughs> um, and so I would go to the computer room in high school and just look up words. Like I had heard the word depression and other things like that. So just going online, looking up what I could and trying to see the symptoms that I felt what matched with certain diagnoses. And of course, back then I didn't have all these terms to right. use. Like it's taken a long time to get that sort of education. Uh, but from there, I like remember ordering a book online from Amazon about depression and reading it and highlighting every part of it and just trying to get a better understanding. Cause in the end, like very much what my grandmother said, but even in your own life, like education is really, really powerful. And the more, you know, the more you can advocate for yourself and the more that you can learn about yourself. So always just trying to learn more. Um, and also what, when you learn more, like I mentioned, like you advocate for yourself, but you also have the language in order to explain um, what you're feeling. So that that was really helpful for me to figure out what was going on. I started going to therapy, learning all about the um, the process of you know health insurance and trying to find someone there. because. Unfortunately, my mom hadn't had any of that experience. So it was, it really was, the onus was on me to figure out what the process was, um, looking for a therapist and trying to find someone that uh, was culturally sensitive, culturally compassionate. That was a, a whole other thing that a lot of us have to go through. So it's a learning process. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, finding culturally responsive care, like you're saying, and perhaps I'm hoping, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, perhaps the fact that you live in New York might have made it a little easier, not a whole lot, but a little easier. You know, I live in one of the whitest cities in the country. And one of the things that I hear over and over from people, you know, communities of color is just the utter lack of access to culturally responsive care. Forget, you know, the whole barrier uh, of affordability of care. 
availability of care, right? Even if you can afford and even if it's available, oftentimes you, you know, it's a real struggle to find somebody that's culturally competent. And I certainly have my share of struggles. And, and again, it's, it's up to you and me, people like you and me that have walked this walk to be able to stand up and share our stories and educate healthcare professionals as well of how to provide culturally responsive care. Right. And I, and I thank you, you know, for the work that you're doing through the photo project, through your book. So I'd love for you to share, you know, um, your book and your goals for the book and feel mm -hmm. free to hold up your book and, you know, share a couple of your stories that you have, uh, you know, included in that book. Yeah. Um, so I guess just quick background of the photo project, just wanting to uh, humanize uh, the experiences of people of color, um, but even more so, um, Black, Indigenous, uh, and people of color. So just looking online, looking at media representation, just not seeing people who look like you or your family or your community in general. So wanting to kind of fill that gap and also find ways to start these conversations because a lot of us are just raised to believe that it's not something that impacts us, that only impacts certain groups who you know are of certain races or uh, who have certain privileges. And so that kind of makes you feel like the onus is on you and that it's your fault that you're experiencing it when really it's something that impacts all of us. So uh, through photos, through art, I think that's a really powerful way to, you know, put a face to the situation, humanize them and really show that it's it's okay to be going through this, that you're not the only one. Um, and so that was an online photo project. And then from there, I wanted to see what I could do with it. Because, you know, when it's online, you have to know about it in order to locate it. And I, I didn't want to create any undue barriers uh, for people to start these conversations. So I decided that I would um, self-publish a book, um, which is uh, right here. <laughs> um, and and then, by the way, The Color of My Mind. Yes, thank you. I, I, I neglected to say the name. Yeah, the color of my mind: um, mental health uh, narratives from people of color. Uh, and then last year, I worked with an independent publisher. I'm very, very thankful uh, to them because the whole idea of having to like fulfill every order is just very overwhelming. So to be able to have uh, a publisher take care of that for me, uh, it, it's it's really amazing. Uh, it's called Reclamation Press. So definitely look into their work. Uh, they focus on uh, people with disabilities and also uplifting the words of BIPOC. So I'm very grateful to them. And so they published uh, a Spanish and English version. So a bilingual version of the book. So that was something that was another way for me to make it more accessible to people. Um, but yeah, I think it's a really good idea for me to read through um, yeah, one or two. Oh, yes, please. Mm. It's so funny, part of me just wants to go and like the first page, page opens up, I'll just read. <laughs> yeah, why not? Every story okay, so, yeah, so this is Eric. Um, and he said, I love that I don't let people dictate who I am as a person and weigh that down on me anymore. I love that I can just be confident in who I am and not worry about what others are thinking about me now. Dancing allows me to express myself without words, which is really good. And that's where it becomes an art. Dancing is also to me both an art and sport because it's just very physical. I want to use one of my gifts to tell a story. Um, and then let's see, okay. And then this is Maria. Mm -hmm. uh, growing up in an Asian family, there is this whole idea that you don't want to bring shame to your family. You want to make it seem like everything is okay. Also, my mom has known ever since she immigrated here was work, work, work. She was never able to focus on herself. It's weird. I know it's a mental illness, but it's also a privilege to even acknowledge that it exists. My family is not just cognizant of mental health because it's not, it's just not a priority. I tend not to speak about my mental illness with them. If I didn't say anything to people, I don't think they would know I have a panic disorder. Um, then let's see if there's another one. So this is, oh, sorry, I think, okay, Dom. <laughs> um, and they say, Part of oppression in our society is we're not even allowed to have emotions. The people that do visibly get to have struggles and be in the narratives are mostly people who are already somewhat accepted in society. It just makes the rest of us more invisible and we deal with this on more levels. I think part of self-care in this capitalist culture is that there's so much pressure behind it. And it took me years to realize that I was obsessively doing self-care and that's not healthy. That's why now, I think of self-care as what is helping undo shame. 
that word shame, right, over and over in our lives. Um, yeah, we've got to change that. And mm -hmm. uh, sharing your story is so is is an incredibly powerful way of not only humanizing, putting a face to mental health, but also removing that stigma and the shame that surrounds it and prevents people from getting life, literally life saving treatments and supports. And so, yeah, again, thank you for the work that you're doing. So since the publication of the book, and and, and do you want to share a little bit about your your hopes for who you would dream of seeing the books in the hands of? Who, who do you want to be utilizing these books? Of course, you know, everybody, but there are also, you, you did have some specific audience for this book. Yeah, I, I would really love for it to be in every counseling center on a college campus, even in high schools, uh, because a lot of these symptoms come up during those ages. Uh, so as many people as possible, but specifically schools, uh, I think that's something that's really important because a lot of times when we are going to predominantly white institutions, we feel alone and to be able to see a book like this in the doctor's office where it, you can't forget that it probably takes a lot uh, in so many ways to even get to that doctor's office, that counseling center. Um, there's a lot of internal work that, that comes into play. So to be able to see someone who looks like you and read the words of people where you can not and be like, I, I feel the same exact thing. I think that that can also help people be more amenable to seeking care and to feel like you're not just one of a few, but you're just one of many. So, and it also just, you know, it'd be cool to have celebrities, you know, have it in their hands. Um, uh, Oprah, you know, just to be able to like get it into more hands, just, um, just increase the visibility of it. Um, so, yeah. yeah. So are you working on any new projects? So right now, um, I'm kind of taking a break. Uh, I, I am taking a course, um, a CNP course, which is a certified nonprofit professional. Uh, I'm trying to use this time to be as um, active, I guess, maybe not the word productive. Uh, I'm also trying to uh, take a rest um, and take care of myself and relax because I had just finished uh, a two year MPH program last year. So I feel like I needed that year or so to kind of decompress and not be in this constant state of having these assignments, going to classes, also working full time and also still doing speaking engagements. Like yeah. it was two years of a lot of things going on. So it's, I'm trying to tell myself that it's okay to not be working on something right now. Um, because there's a sense that productivity is indicative of your self-worth and that's, that's not the case. So, um, I'm I'm really excited to be able to do something next. I'm I'm still kind of in the works and trying to figure out what that would look like. Yeah. Well, honey, you have already contributed so much, and um, you, you're taking a very well deserved rest. And uh, <laughs> I'm sure your creativity is only going to flow stronger <laughs> once you've had the time for reflection and for rest and rejuvenation. So uh, mm -hmm. that's awesome that you get to take some time off. You know, Thank and family is so important for all of us, right? And and even more so within cultures like the Latino culture or the Indian culture. And regardless, our families are the glue that hold us together. And, and sometimes, like you said, you know, um, when it comes to matters of mental health, because of a lack of education, lack of understanding or acceptance, it can be difficult. Now having, being where you are in your own journey, that started when you were an eight-year-old little child, right? Mm -hmm. Looking back, what words of comfort or advice do you have for other families, other parents, you know, to let them know that we're all in this together and here's what you need to know as you're raising your children and creating this family and traversing through life, what words of comfort and advice do you have for families? Yeah. Um... Also just thinking about coming from that Im immigrant experience, my father is an immigrant, my grandfather is an immigrant, and uh, a lot of times we have this idea of what success looks like. Uh, you know, having a good job, putting food on the table, having a family, and kind of trying to redefine what success looks like. So thinking about it as more of a quality of life issue, like what kind of life do you wanna live? Do you wanna live a life where you're not thinking about your mental health, and then therefore that impacts everything that you have in terms of goals. Like if you're not taking care of your mental health, you'll have trouble 
you know, doing your work at your job. Um, your family relationships might suffer. Uh, you know, all these things. Uh, just thinking about how mental health is so much a part of that. So, thinking about less uh, as mental illness because I think that can be very hard for families to to grab grasp. Um, and so, thinking about it as wellness, quality of life, and trying to end that cycle. Uh, just even me thinking about my family and all the things that they have gone through, and and only if they had really prioritized and thought about their mental health, I think that their quality of life would have been so much better. Also thinking about generational trauma, like once we start like taking care of our mental health, we can slowly slow down that cycle and, and create a, a sense of um, purpose in, in the sense that what you wanna accomplish in your life is to be happy. Um, and, and to be healthy and at peace. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, absolutely. Just honoring our humanity and paying attention to ourselves and being self-aware to take care of ourselves and respect and love ourselves as much as we so much easily love and respect mm -hmm. other people most of the time, right? So no, all uh, incredibly important points. So it's been such a pleasure talking with you, Dio. Thank you for being with Thank us. You. To the very, very best. Lots of luck to you and your family. I'm so glad that all of you have come through this COVID storm are here, healthy, safe, together. Give them all my love and thank you. I just want to thank you. you join us. I just want to say, you know, come back and join us again uh, on July 24th for another conversation on hope and healing. We'll have Melody Maezi, an amazing mental health advocate and award-winning author and speaker. She'll be talking about the healing power of Rumi's poetry. Uh, so thanks again, Dior. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Have a good weekend.